Hey everyone, Cynix here. It's time for the next episode of Paint Over Pals. So let's dive right in and see what my patrons have given me this month. First up, we have a little robot design by AC. I do like that you kept the overall design simplistic and clean, but I think we can work on the overall balance just a bit. It's always helpful to make a little profile diagram of things just to get a better understanding of the design. The leg connection is feeling a bit weak, so we can beef that up a bit. Personally, I think this style of reverse jointed leg looks best with a hint of added mass near the top, especially if we can counterbalance that reverse joint with some forward weight or even another stabilizing joint. We can think of it as an immobilized thigh area or something like that. You've made the arms extra beefy, which is fun, so we just need to make sure they're counterbalanced properly with everything else. Also, making the upper arm slightly thinner will vary the shape language enough to make it a little bit more appealing. Back to your painting down here, the inward bend in the legs creates the feeling that the knees are buckling inward. This could work if you were trying to show a struggle with weight, but let's try to avoid making it look like our robot is buckling under its own weight. I like to bring the legs outward slightly to create an added sense of stability, but you don't have to be as extreme as me. The whole rendering got a bit cloudy and dirty, so I'm going to simplify it completely. Values need to work on the most basic level, and every added complexity of rendering should never lead the values to stray too far from that. I also think that the sizes of different shapes could use some adjusting. For instance, a bigger eye and some smaller upper arms, like I mentioned earlier. There is a logic to these size decisions, but it's a whole video in itself, and don't worry, I'll make a video about it soon. Lastly, let's try to balance the legs on the other drawing as well. It looks like the robot is lifting a giant slab of concrete, but judging from his legs, he seems to just be prancing along like it weighs nothing at all. This is one time where we might want the legs to be buckling a bit. As long as we balance the weight well enough, you can practically do anything. I'm going to make the robot a tad pigeon-toed just to show some added strain. Remember, if you're going for balance, let the toes point inward toward each other if the legs are wide apart, and let them point away from each other if the legs are close together. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Here is a painting by Jacob. It looks like he spent plenty of time rendering this, so that's a good habit to have. I think this might be a character from Hero Academia or something. I only watched a couple episodes, but it seems somewhat familiar. Anyway, the rendering is solid. The facial features have nice edges and forms. Although the realism of the scowl might be making the character look a little bit more uglier than desired. I don't know, who knows? The values are also mostly fine. You did a good job with the darks and lights and the fire especially. The main problems are, sadly, things that are really difficult to solve with the paint over. The overall shapes and composition are really letting things down a bit. Focus is also an issue, but not in the traditional sense. The texture density is just very thick from top to bottom. All of these things somewhat fit into a category we will call dynamicism. To go back to the composition, if we break down the composition, we'll basically just see a central figure with very little moving forward or backward in space. And we also seem to lose one of the arms into the lines of the body. If things have to be on a very flat plane, it's a good idea to make the silhouette avoid blobbing together too much. Preferably, you can just avoid the flatness altogether and make sure things are moving toward and away from the camera, but filling up the composition in a more complex way can also be extremely helpful. We really don't want everything to fit too squarely in the middle of the canvas. Just to briefly mention effects, the detail of the fire looks great, but be sure to aim for a strong graphical flow. It's one of the few times you should be thinking about how to draw more like an illustrator and not like a painter. I think I need to do an addendum to my drawing like a painter video. Uh, but just always do the opposite. If something seems like it would be easiest to tackle through painting, then draw it. If something seems like it would be much easier to draw, then paint it. <laughs> that seems to be a good rough guideline. 
Once again, that's just bringing up minor topics that could really use their own videos. But anyway, just avoid all of that texture density as well. The background especially became incredibly dense with noise and cloudiness. I'll mess with it a little, but I don't have a good idea for how to do a paint over on this one without just repainting the whole thing in a different composition. Sorry about that, it's more of a critique than a paint over this time. Jacob also sent in a previous image he had painted of Saitama from One Punch Man. I just wanted to quickly point out that this suffers from a major issue with dynamicism as well. If you were to draw a diagram of this image from above, it's almost unintentionally brilliant how well this showcases the problem. You can see how his entire body is twisting to conform itself to a flat plane. It's like it's trying to be as flat as possible. Even the main graphical elements manage to not overlap with anything, which just further emphasizes the concept of flatness. Luckily, I don't think you'll have too much trouble fixing this in the future. So Jacob, I really want to see you put those rendering skills to good use. Just make sure you do more compositional thumbnails in the future and focus on dynamicism. All right, let's keep things moving along. Here we have some sketches by Brian. Those body proportions are reasonable, but it looks like you've been struggling with facial features a bit. Two main issues are going to come up. You need to first find a little more confidence in avoiding unnecessary and chicken scratchy lines. But more importantly, you need to pay attention to your T-lines. I know I talked about T-lines in the last episode, but as far as I'm concerned, it's worth going over them as much as possible. I'll make a little diagram in a moment, but every eye, nose, and mouth, and random fold or flap should always be describing a form by showing which lines go under which other lines. If you're drawing an eye slightly from one side, make sure to show that the line farther from us is being tucked under the line closer to us. I wound up changing the eye shapes a bit more than I had planned to, but oh well, hopefully the idea comes across. On the figure drawing on the right, the biggest benefit you can get is by simplifying things. It can apply to limbs and everything, but most importantly, let's apply it to the face. Instead of focusing on iconically drawing an eye and a nose and everything you know should be there, let's just roughly hint at where they might be. This loose reference point will allow the viewer to fill in complexity and also allow the artist to further define things much more realistically if they ever choose to. The last one I have for you guys this month is a painting by Jory. This looks quite nice, the colors are pleasant, and the values feel good. The first thing that jumps to mind is that it feels like the setup for something more. Like it wants to tell a story, but the story hasn't been added to it yet. Well, anyway, that's not super relevant, so let's just take a closer look as it is. A new issue has begun to jump out at me. I think these branches are a bit weird. They seem almost hair-like, and somehow they also feel tinier at the base than they do at the end, which ruins that whole branchy aesthetic. I don't know why that happened, but it's certainly easy enough to fix. I think the contrast on the falling leaves is also a bit extreme. They're definitely the highest contrast part of the whole image and I'll come back to those in a bit. But the other thing that is beginning to stand out is the cloudiness of the snow near the bottom. It's generating a confusing level of scale that doesn't quite seem appropriate for the distance it is at. I'm going to smooth through it just a bit and maybe add some crisper details if I get a chance. Maybe some of the falling leaves are already on the ground or something like that. And while I'm at it, I'll try to add those leaves back in, but without that sharp highlight anymore. That should lessen the focus a little bit. I could also create some details that are a little bit out of focus to possibly create a little more depth as well. Well, I think that's about it for the paint over. Still, it does feel like a waste to not add a story in there. Maybe we can just add a couple giant building structures in the background. I don't know, maybe some airships, just the usual stuff. We still need an entry point for the viewer though, so maybe a cliche hooded figure will work just fine for that. There we go, now we have a proper little illustration for our 20XX Little Red Riding Hood story. 
All right, everyone, it seems like we've come to the end of this episode. That wasn't too bad, although I am still feeling a bit talkative. Maybe I can just sneak a little vlog onto the end here and no one will notice. I have been away for the past two weeks on a little bit of a summer adventure. And who doesn't love hearing about other people's vacations? So without further ado, it's time to hear about Cynix's silly 2017 Oregonian road trip with Joyce. Early one morning, my wife and I set off from the realm of Orange County toward the mysterious and exciting land of Sacramento. Along the way, we got to try the local delicacies of the I-5, which happens to be bland white people food. After much driving, we finally arrived at our destination, the Jetty Jet Show. Jet was nice enough to let us rest up at his place in Sacramento and show us the exciting world of VR. Be sure to check out his YouTube channel for some great art videos and some nonsense from my stay there as well. I have to say, VR is kind of great. I was a VR virgin going in and half expected it to be pretty gimmicky and not that cool, but it was wonderful and I could definitely see it becoming more and more mainstream in the future. I was using the HTC Vive, by the way, which Jet has, and it's amazing. Anyway, Jet showed us around Sacramento, where we got to try out some amazing foods. We had some Chinese cumin lamb rolls from Mr. Yang's, and literally the best pancakes I've ever had in my entire life at Harry's Cafe. No joke, I've eaten 100 different pancakes in my day, and these are the best ever. I'm serious, go get yourself a Harry pancake someday. Eventually, after spending many hours in deep VR, we grabbed some amazing banh mi's and headed back on our adventure. Our first stop was Bernie Falls, a pretty good waterfall, not super tall, but very scenic and relaxing to hang out by. This is a good time to mention that the main reason for this road trip was to find cool waterfalls and experience the culture of Oregon. We live in Southern California where everything is always dry and hot, so it's incredibly refreshing to be around running water and dense forests. Okay, let's get back on the road. Next stop, Oregon. We held up in Medford for the night, which, by the way, has some amazingly weird and tasty burgers. And if you want some general traveling advice, always use Airbnb. It's cheaper than regular motels and hotels and you actually get a unique experience of that area you're staying in. Our Airbnb in Medford actually had a big fat bunny rabbit living in it, and he was super cuddly and adorable. We set off early for our next outdoor adventure, Coosa Falls, which was definitely a bit more wild and naturey than the last one. We were also feeling a bit brave, so we decided to go on a hike to find the elusive Tamalich. I heard it was three miles away, which didn't sound that bad, but then again, I don't do much hiking. The trail was actually hidden and unmarked, which is probably not a good sign, but we managed to hike through the rain and mud for nearly two hours just to make it to the destination. The Tamalich, a natural bright blue colored lake. It was quite pretty, but we were too beat up from hiking to enjoy it properly. It was also getting late, but we managed to make it back to the car just before sunset. The whole hike took over four hours, and unfortunately I didn't have any hiking shoes, and the crappy shoes I did wear on the hike had rubbed through my sock and burned a bloody hole into the back of my foot. It was quite a miserable pain to endure while we were hiking back, but it was an adventure. We stopped by Sahali Falls as we left, another waterfall near the same spot. Also quite beautiful and wild, but I could barely walk at the moment, so we decided to call it a day and drive up to Portland. We managed to stay at a lovely Airbnb in a very artsy area along a lake, and the next day we did our best to explore the weirdness of Portland. As a 90s skater kid, I just had to stop by the Burnside Skate Park. You may remember it if you ever played the first Tony Hawk game. We wandered around downtown for a bit, but I'll be honest, I couldn't find any part of Portland that was as weird as I hoped for. Oh well, they do have a lovely Japanese garden that was a nice little spot to hang out for a bit. 
I think the weirdest thing we managed to find in Portland was a little cafe called Remsky Corsa Coffee. They're going for a bit of a haunted house vibe, so everything is dimly lit and they have live piano music. Amusingly enough, after about 30 minutes of sitting at our table, we suddenly realized it was up around our chin level. Another 30 minutes and it was down around our knees. So things were moving, but they were also changing so slowly that you didn't even notice. It was a charming little gimmick, and apparently a handful of tables around the restaurant all do different gimmicks like that. I think one rotates and one vibrates or something like that. Anyway, the dessert and drinks were pretty good, so it was a decent place overall. The bathroom was weird, and I'll leave it at that. Alright, I think I'm talking way more than I planned, so let's zoom along. We stopped by more waterfalls outside of Portland. Horseshoe and Ponytail Falls were an enjoyable short little hike that lets you actually get behind and above some of the lovely waterfalls. Both of them are only a couple miles from Multnomah Falls, which is a bit crowded and touristy, but it's also the tallest waterfall on this trip. So it's a lovely sight, but you don't really get to experience it up close. Finally, we started to head back south toward home, but not before our last Airbnb stay in Oregon. This time, we managed to find an interesting place out in a rural area of Oregon. We had a charming room with an old piano out among the trees and wild animals. It felt like a pretty quintessential Oregonian experience. Everyone was raising their own farm animals and growing their own pot. It's pretty amusing. We closed things out by going on a cave tour. There aren't many caves along the west coast, but this one was pretty fun. If you've never been on a cave tour, you should definitely try it someday. Anyway, we spent a couple more days hanging out with Jet, and that's about it. Road trip complete. So congrats on making it through all the way to the end of the video. Hopefully you got inspired to do more exploring, maybe go on a road trip of your own. It's a good way to get to see new things and meet new people. Okay, well, thank you all for watching, and a continually large thank you to all of my Patreon supporters. You guys are amazing. See you, everyone.